Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us here at our online service. It's uh, been a while since we've seen you all. And, uh, you know, I was talking to uh, some of the guys in my life group last night over Zoom as we were meeting um, through that platform. And uh, he mentioned, man, wouldn't it be so nice if we could just have a fire, a campfire, and sit together and sing some songs? He said, I really just miss doing simple things like that. So I thought, hey, why don't we just try it here today? Um, it's not quite the same, but imagine that you are sitting around the campfire as we sing together. And uh, I don't know about you, but, um, you know, the week I've had, I'm just, I was thinking about the worship and I thought the one thing I want to do is just cry out to Jesus and ask him for help. That's where I'm at right now. So if you're there too, then, uh, man, I just, uh, this is your, this is your day. So let's, uh, without further ado, let's sing together. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changes not thy compassion, they fail not. the church apart in for sin in a peace that is Blessings on my 
As someone who likes to study cultures and history, living in such a time as this is absolutely fascinating for a person like me. I mean, we all agree we are living in unprecedented times. I'm sure you've told your children over and over, you'll be telling your children's children this story someday. But what's so fascinating to me about this is that one, we are a nation in self-isolation. And I think there's a great dichotomy in this, in this whole idea because on one side of the coin, you have us as a, as a nation going through something all together in, in a way that we haven't experienced in a long time. Because the virus does not discriminate whether you're rich, poor, young, old, black, white, Hispanic, all of us are susceptible. If Tom Hanks can get this virus, I think we can say easily that any of us can get this virus, right? 
And so it's interesting that we're going through this together and there's a sense of national pride right now in our heroes, our, our first responders, our healthcare workers, even the grocery store workers. I mean, we applaud your efforts in keeping this country going. And yet on the other side of the coin, we are a nation in self-isolation, meaning we have to keep our distance from each other. We have to treat the other person as a potential carrier. At times, we have to compete for the same things like toilet paper or milk or meat. And so it's just interesting. We're coming together, and yet we're still isolated from one another. So as living in a nation in self-isolation, there's been incredible challenges, right? For some of us more than others. I mean, if we're honest, for some of us, we haven't been impacted all of that much. I mean, it's knocked us out of our normal routine, but we still have our jobs. We're still working you know, we're, we're healthy. Not a lot has really impacted us yet. But I know for some of you out there, your jobs have been taken away. Your business has been lost. I know for some of you who are older folks, you're living in such a stressful time. Just going to the grocery store, who would imagine would be so stressful? So I know it's been a challenge for, for all of us in one way or the other. And perhaps one of the worst parts about all of this is that we have no idea when all this is going to be over. Is it going to be a couple weeks from now that we start getting back to things? Is it going to be a few months from now? Is it going to be a next year? We have no idea. But here's the thing that I want you to think about this morning. No matter who you are, since we're all in this together, we can do one of two things. We can make the best out of a bad situation, or we can allow a bad situation to get the best of us. And I know I sound like a motivational speaker right now, and I apologize, but that's true, isn't it? I mean, we really can't control the circumstances around us, but we can control how we respond to those circumstances. And so to set the tone for our series, I want to read something to you that I think is so helpful and so wise at this time, something that the Apostle Paul wrote to a church. In fact, he didn't just write this to one church. He wrote something very similar to another church, because I think this was just such helpful advice for all of us to hear. So here's what he writes in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. He says, be very careful then how you live. And for some of you, it's like, that's what I've been doing the last few weeks or months. I've been washing my hands. I've been keeping my distance from people. I've been staying at home. Paul says, that's great, but, but here's what I mean by that. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. And it's, well, what do you mean, Paul? Paul says next, making the most of every opportunity. Now, if you've heard this passage taught before or preached before, chances are you know that this phrase is actually literally translated, redeem the time. And to redeem something means to buy it back or to purchase something of equal or greater value. And Paul says, I want you to think about your time for a minute. Your time is the most precious commodity that you have. What are you doing with it? What are you buying with it? What are you exchanging it for? Are you wasting your time or are you making the most of your time? Now, the problem that many of us struggle with is that we don't see what's happening to us as an opportunity at this moment. And I understand that completely because we do have lots of challenges and obstacles that we're facing. But here's the thing about opportunities that I want you to consider this morning. Opportunities can easily be mistaken for obstacles if we're not careful. See, I know many of you, again, are at home right now and you're stuck at home and you've been working from home and it's just home, 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 home. And it seems like such a challenge and a burden and an obstacle every single day to wake up and deal with the same people and deal with the same challenges. But let me just ask you, are there any opportunities that you're missing right now that are there that you just don't see because you're mistaking them for an obstacle? You know, for some of you who are staying at home and working from home, perhaps you have more time now with your kids than maybe you've ever had before. What are you doing with that time? And believe you me, I've heard from my wife who's teaching our four kids at home, you know, doing the homeschool thing. It is a challenge to do this every single day. But don't miss those opportunities to get a little bit more of your child's heart right now in ways that you don't when, when they're at school. See, there's opportunities all around us if we're just willing to open our eyes, but they can be easily mistaken for obstacles if we're not careful. So Paul says, be wise in this. 
And here's the reason why. Because the days are evil, he says. And what he means by this is if we just sit down and lift our feet up, the current of our culture will inevitably push us and lead us to places where we really don't want to go. The culture is always trying to push us away from and distract us from things that are the most important to us. And if we're not careful, we'll look back and go, this is not where I want to be. This is not, one of, this is not who I want to be. You see, you may be wondering, you know, why is it that I keep undermining myself? Why is it that I don't just waste other people's time? Why is it that I waste so much of my time? Why do I do things that I know I shouldn't do and I know I not, you know, ought to do? And why do I do these things? And Paul says it's simple. One of the reasons is because we live in a culture that pushes us away from the things that are most important to us. So he says, be wise in this because the days are evil. He says, therefore, because of our culture, because of just how things are, do not be foolish. You know what a foolish person does? A foolish person is someone who knows what they need to do. They know what they ought to do, and yet they don't do it. They just keep on doing the same thing, and they keep hurting themselves. That's what a foolish person does. He says, don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And I don't know if you've ever been taught this or not, but God has a will for your life. God has a plan for your life. And yes, we can sit down and debate what that plan exactly is. But here's the one thing I do know from what Paul just said. God wants you to make the most of every opportunity that comes your way. And I know we're not supposed to do this, but hang with me. What if we replace the word opportunity for a second? What if we took out opportunity and we put in self-isolation. What if Paul wrote to us, make the most of your self-isolation? Because what if God wanted you to make the most of your self-isolation right now? For the next several weeks or months, what if he wants to do that? What if right now, God in your self-isolation was simply wanting you to work, not just on helping your neighbors, and that's great, and doing, but but working on you and your relationship with him. What if right now was the perfect season for you to grow in your relationship or to start a relationship with him? What if making the most of your self-isolation included, and you can argue with me on this one, but included making the most of yourself? See, let me ask you this question. Who's been the hardest person to live with these last few weeks or months? Who's been the hardest person? And don't answer out loud, especially if they're sitting right next to you. But perhaps the hardest person you're living with at this moment isn't your kids, and it isn't your spouse, and it isn't your roommate, it isn't your neighbor. Perhaps the hardest person that you're living with is you. You see, the reality is we can become our own worst enemies. We can undermine ourselves more than anyone else can. In fact, there are two great enemies of the self. One of them is self-denial. And self-denial is simply just us, really that voice saying, everything's fine, everything's good, I don't have a problem, I can stop whenever I want, that's not really an issue, it doesn't impact anybody else, it's, it's not a, it's, I'm fine. That's self-denial. The other thing is self-justification. It's a cousin to self-denial. But self-justification really recognizes, yeah, I I do these things, and yeah, it may be not so good, but you would do them too if you had the kind of kids that I have, right? You'd be impatient too if you had to deal with them all day. I mean, you would drink too if you had the day that I had. I mean, we, we can justify things so easily, especially in a season like this. Well, I mean, this is a pandemic after all, right? And we can make excuse after excuse after excuse. But here's the good news this morning. There is an antidote to self-denial and there is an antidote to self-justification and that is called self-examination. And there's a number of places in in the scriptures where it talks about self-examination, but I thought it'd be really fitting for us to look at another nation that was in isolation. And I want you to turn with me to Lamentations chapter 3. And if you're not familiar with Lamentations, it's right next to the book of Jeremiah. So it's a little bit more than halfway through the Bible. 
And the reason it's connected to Jeremiah is because Lamentations was ascribed to the prophet Jeremiah. People think that he wrote it. And Jeremiah was, interestingly enough, a contemporary during one of the most devastating and isolating periods for the nation of Israel. See, in 586 and the months leading up to that, King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, who was the king of the superpower of that day, came to Jerusalem and laid siege to the city, which meant he surrounded the city for up to about 30 months. And he did not allow anything to go in, and he certainly did not allow anyone to go out. And he just waited, and he allowed the people to starve to death and to start fighting themselves, and it became so horrific. But finally, in 586, King Nebuchadnezzar broke down the walls and marched his way into Jerusalem. And he laid waste to the city, and he destroyed the temple, and he took anything and everything that was of value back to Babylon. And after this exile, or after this devastation, Jeremiah, who decided to stay in the city, laments over the loss. And he writes these songs. These lamentations is simply just a list of songs lamenting this destruction of Jerusalem. In fact, it was so bad. Let me just read to you just the first couple uh, verses in chapter 1 of just kind of painting this picture of what they were experiencing. Here's what he says. How deserted lies the city, once so full of people. I mean, meaning you walk around in the streets and there's nobody there. There's just, it's just empty. It's kind of like this idea of if you see New York City right now or, or the cities like Chicago or L.A., it's just bare streets. There's nobody out. He goes on, how like a widow is she, meaning there's no one to help, who once was great among the nations. Bitterly she weeps at night, tears are on her cheeks. Among all her lovers, there is no one to comfort her. In other words, she's all alone. She's isolated and the city has been destroyed and it's just devastation. And it's in the midst of this that you can just imagine how angry those people are who are still in Jerusalem. You know, anytime things don't go our way, it's easy to start blaming other people. And you can imagine just the, 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 the blame games going on, people wanting to, to wag their finger at the Jewish leadership for getting them into this mess. It would have been easy to blame King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon for coming in and destroying everything. In fact, it would have been easy to kind of blame God for this because they were God's chosen people and he didn't protect them at this time. And they do a little bit of that in Lamentations. But yet what's so interesting in the midst of these songs, Jeremiah does something different. Jeremiah says, let's not point the finger at other people. And that's what we are doing today, right? We can, we can point our finger at, at the politicians. We can point our finger at China. We can, we can blame so many other people. But he says, at this moment, Maybe the best thing to do is to pause and do some self-examination. Here's what he writes in Lamentations chapter 3, verse 40. He says, Let us examine our ways and test them. I know it's easy to blame others at this point, but let's just kind of look at our lives. And I'm not saying that we need to blame ourselves for this virus. Please don't hear me say that. But what he says is, let's just kind of look at our lives. What an opportunity we have to look at what we've been doing, to see the kind of impact we've had on people. Let's examine our ways. Let's test them out. Let's look at ourselves. So he, he calls for them to do some self-examination. Now, I understand when we talk about looking at ourselves, that's tough to do. So sometimes, you know, we can look everywhere else but in the mirror. In fact, I love what Pascal said. He said this, By means of diversion, we can avoid our own company 24 hours a day. Meaning we can get so caught up in what we're doing, so busy, we can be so distracted and intentionally distracted that we forget to even think about what's going on inside of us and, and our own company, our, our own thoughts, our own behavior. So Jeremiah says, let's pause. And let's consider our ways. And I think this is where our opportunity comes in because let's, again, let's be real here. Sports are done for now. Those business trips are over right now. Those, those long flights, those days away. I mean, chances are, if we're honest, most of us would have maybe some extra time 
on our hands. I'm not saying everyone does, but let's be honest, there, there are opportunities out there. And one of the opportunities that we have right now is to kind of pause and to look at ourselves, to grow in our self-awareness. And so the question is, how do you do that? And so let me give you two kind of simple techniques or strategies or ways to do that. The first one is by simply asking ourselves the right questions. You know, right questions are so powerful. Right questions have the power to lead us in the right direction. You think about Jesus and his conversations with people. He was a master at this. If you listen to the conversations and watch how he asks just the right question at the right time, and it cuts past the self-denial, it cuts through the self-justification, and it gets right to the person's heart. And so I, I am no Jesus, obviously. And I'm not going to even pretend that I know the right question for you at, the, at this time. But let me just give you some starter questions to consider this morning. Some questions that have been helpful for me. Some of these questions, some men that I have, uh, you know, respected for years have posed to me that I've wrestled with. And I, I've come up with 10. You can come up with a thousand or three, whatever you want. But here's kind of my top 10 for this morning. Number one is this. What is it that I want? I need you to ask yourself that question. What is it that I really want? What is my heart's desire? And I know for men especially, when I talk to guys, they really struggle with this question. But the reason this question is so important is because wherever our heart is, I mean, that's where we're going to end up, right? I mean, that's where our, the direction we're going to take. So what is it that I want? And I'm not saying what you want is good, what is it's bad. I'm not, I don't know, but what is it that you want out of this life? What's your vision for your life? Number two is for married couples. And I'll start with the guys. Men, I need you to ask yourself this question. Does my wife feel cherished by me? And if you don't know that answer, maybe you need to go ask her. And the same for wives out there, but we're going to ask it a little bit different. For you, you need to ask yourself, does my husband feel respected by me? And again, if you don't know that answer, maybe you should go ask him. Here's another one. Who am I trying to prove myself to? You see, for some of us, if you're like me, I'm always feeling like I'm, never, I'm just never good enough. I'm, I'm never a, a good enough pastor. I'm never a good enough husband. I'm never a good enough father. And yet, the question really is, who am I trying to prove myself to? Well, I had a friend who, who posed that question to me, and that just kind of rocked me to my core. So I want you to wrestle with that one. Another one of my favorites is this. What, what has been my strongest thoughts lately? What have been my strongest thoughts lately? You see, we all have, we all have a voice in our head, and we're actually going to talk about this next week, but what, what are those thoughts leading me to? Here's another one. What am I looking forward to? Where's, where's my hope lie? What I have discovered in my own life is that if, if I don't have something I'm looking forward to, then I get awfully depressed. So what is it that is maybe on your calendar? What is it something that just maybe days from now, weeks from now, months from now, years from now that you're looking forward to that you can, you can look and, and find hope in? What am I trusting God with? What am I trusting God with? What, am I, what have I decided to kind of lay down at his feet something that's maybe causing me angst and anxiety. And now I'm just going to say, God, I'm going to give this to you. I'm going to, I'm going to lay this at your feet and I'm going to trust you to deal with this because, because I know I'm not in control anyways. Or am I becoming more open-handed or am I becoming less open-handed? Am I becoming a person during this season of life where my hands are opening up and I'm becoming more generous more generous with my time, more generous with my money, more generous with my belongings, or am I someone who's being more closed-handed? Or this one, how have I been spending my time? You know, maybe after, after the whole day, you look back, have I made the most of my time like Paul told us to, or have I wasted a lot of my time? What am I doing with my time these days? Or what kind of example 
have I been to those around me? Because even though we're maybe in self-isolation, chances are other people are still around us somewhat. What kind of example have I been demonstrating? Have I been living in fear or have I been showing incredible faith to them? What kind of example am I setting for others? And finally, what did I thank God for today? Because let's be honest, there's always something to thank God for. So what am I thanking God for? What have I thanked God for? What can I thank God for? That just kind of changes your attitude a little bit, doesn't it? And it kind of just kind of shows us where our heart is. And so questions are powerful. But, you know, if you're a Jesus follower this morning, we have another way of going about this. And even if you're not a Jesus follower, I invite you to try this. But hopefully this makes sense to us who are Jesus followers. And it's not simply asking ourselves questions, but it's praying a prayer that David prayed. It can be found in Psalm 139, verse 23. Here's what he says. He says, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See, apparently David was feeling anxious and he really didn't understand why. So what did he do? He invited the one person who knew him better than himself. He invited God in and said, God, show me what's going on inside of me. Search me. Get your magnifying glass out and see what's going on. I I feel this angst and I don't know why. Search me, God. Because David knew. God knew him better than himself. I mean, God knew him inside and out. In fact, that was the whole Psalm 139 is about that. Starting in verse 1, he says, you've searched me, Lord. you already done that. You, you know me, he says. You know when I sit and when I rise, you perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all of my ways. He says, before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. So he says, who better to ask what's going on in my heart than the one who formed my heart, who can search me inside and out? So this was really an invitation for examination. In fact, he would later go on, he says, see if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. I can't think of a better prayer to pray than this one in this season of life. God, show me what's going on. But do you know why many of us don't do this, this? Why many of us don't pray this prayer? Why many of us don't ask the hard questions? For some of us, we're afraid what we're going to find out. But I think for the majority of us out there, I think deep down inside, we probably already know the answers to these and we don't want to deal with it. And Paul would say, don't do that. Because that is the definition of foolishness. Remember, being a a foolish person is someone who knows what they ought to do and yet doesn't choose to do it. And Paul says, don't be foolish, but be wise and make the most of every opportunity that you have. He's saying, now's the time to make the most of your time. And I think that begins with looking at you and your relationship with God. But see, don't misunderstand this. Self-examination isn't just an exercise that we do to pass on the time and and either to feel good about ourselves or bad about ourselves. Self-examination is not the end. In fact, I love what Tim Keller said. He says, self-awareness is never the destination. It is only a step on the way to transformation. You see, when Jeremiah invited the the remnants to, to look at themselves in this devastation. He says this, he says, let us examine our ways and test them. But notice what he says next, and let us return to the Lord. See, that's the point in this exercise. This is how we grow in our self-awareness without becoming self-absorbed. We invite Jesus into this picture and we move further and further towards Jesus. We say, this is not just about me. This is me and my relationship with him. Let me ask you this question. You know, in light of what Jeremiah said, let's, let us return to the Lord. What's keeping you from returning to the Lord? If, if you're kind of further away from him, if you recognize there, there's a distance between you and him, what's keeping you from going back? For some of you, you've maybe never actually taken a step towards Jesus. And let me encourage you, what a great time. There's no better time than today to do that. 
And I know many of you are out there watching this and you are Jesus followers. But if you're honest, you would say maybe this, this last month or two, I've been kind of knocked off my routine and I just kind of feel distant from God. What a great opportunity to return to the Lord. See, God's will is that he wants an ever-deepening relationship with you. That's another thing I know for sure that God wants for you. He wants an ever-deepening relationship with you. Are you willing to move in his direction? Are you willing to invite him in? See, here's my last question. What story will you tell after all this is over? See, we're all going to be sharing the story for the rest of our lives, how, how we survived or how we dealt with the 2020 pandemic. But what kind of story are you going to share? Is your story going to go something like, well, you know, I kind of just hunker down day after day. I watched the news and I felt pretty anxious most of the time. I didn't really do much. I didn't really feel like praying very much. I, I just didn't know what to do. I kind of, kind of froze in this season of life. Or is your story going to be different? Is your story going to be something like, you know what? I realize, wow, I, I do maybe have some extra time. And wow, my, my faith and my character and all these things are being tested maybe like they've never been before. And what I did was I pressed into Jesus. And when I did that, boy, my time with him was so sweet. I prayed more than I maybe have ever prayed before. I read scripture in ways that I never read and, and I drew more out of it. I fasted. And man, did he grow me? Did he grow my faith? And the more I pressed into him, the more he began to transform me. It was such a sweet time with Jesus. Because I, I, made, I made the most of this opportunity. What's your story going to be? Now, I would love to pray with you, but before we do that, if you're watching this and it's still Sunday and it's still before 1130, I would love to invite you to join us on Zoom at 1130 with our first responder team. It's led by Darren and Jane this morning, but they're, they're willing just to, to be online and to receive uh, whatever you have. If you want to just talk, if you want to digest some of the things that you heard, if you need prayer, if you just want to talk to someone, another human being, they're going to be available at 1130 on Zoom. And we have that link provided for you on our page. But if you are watching this and it's after 1130, I encourage you to contact us, to engage with us. Go to our website. Let us know you watched. If you have a question, if you have a prayer request, or if you have a, a question for self-examination that you want to share with everybody else, post that too. Let us know. But we'd love for you to engage with what we've been talking about in our new series. And so hopefully you can join us at 1130 on Zoom. But let me pray for us right now as we close up. God, thank you so much for your son, Jesus. I thank you that he is always the person that we're moving towards. At least that's our prayer. That, that he is our ultimate destination. He is our ultimate hope, our ultimate joy, our ultimate peace. And God, if we've been moving in another direction, would you show us that? If there are things in our heart that is unpleasing to you, would you reveal that to us? Even right now. If there's a question that needs to be asked of us, would you whisper that in our ear? God, I thank you that even in the midst of all of this upheaval and loss and change and, and even tragedy, we can turn to you and find rest and the hope and the peace and the strength keep moving. God, I pray, Lord, that we press into you and make the most of this opportunity while we still have it. And I pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Thanks, guys. See you next week.